morning and happy Sabbath to everybody here at the church and at home online. Why me? Or what have I ever done to deserve forgiveness, mercy, and grace? That is the topic that we'll be talking about today. For my part in the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew is forgive us, Lord, our debts as we forgive those who are we are in debt to. Or else as in Luke, where he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or another way of saying it would be, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. This is a very important message that Jesus has for all of us today about forgiveness. Over this past year, since the start of COVID-19 and other events that have t transpired with the death of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or any other of the social events that have happened this year that have put a divide in the country, the election and any of the other ones, there has been something that has been drastically missing for this nation to heal. And that is the ability of one another to forgive each other. Forgive, forgive us each other the things that we may have done knowingly or unknowingly to harm somebody else, either by thoughts or actions, words, or even our deeds. All of these things help divide us, but, but through forgiveness, we can be joined together. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does it mean condoning or excusing the offenses. It's not a forgive and forget. The, th the harm that's there is always going to be there. It's the ability to get past that resentment, that anger, that guilt, that shame that we hold inside each and every one of us. Holding these things in, these emotions, these feelings, only do us harm. They don't do us any good. They cause stress in our lives, which raises our blood pressure, which adds to more stress, which adds to more other illnesses. You may not sleep well. You may not be eating well. Your stomach may have problems. All of these things are tied to resentment being within each of us and staying there. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we have, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus's topic on forgiveness is in this prayer goes along with what Steve talked about last week as far as giving us our daily bread. Forgiveness is something we need to come every day to the Lord about. And preparing for this sermon and reading a book I've been reading for the, about the last month, it's called The Cost, Cost of the Discipleship by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And this is a really interesting and powerful book right now in my life. If you don't know, Bonhoeffer was a German theologian, a Lutheran by um, denomination. And he was one of the ones that plotted against the demise of Adolf Hitler and saw that his brand of nationalism was not good for Germany. And not having God in the lives of the German people would also not be good for them. And the book, The Cost of Discipleship, is written about the Sermon on the Mount, which we are studying right now, in the midst of it with the Lord's Prayer. And he breaks down every little section of the prayer, as we are doing here. And on the part about forgive us our debts, he goes, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Every day, Christ followers must acknowledge and bewail their guilt. Living as they do in fellowship with him, they ought to be sinless. But in practice, their life is marred daily with all manner of unbelief. Sloth in prayer, lack of bodily discipline, self-indulgence of every kind, envy, hatred, and ambition. No wonder what they must pray daily for God's forgiveness. But God will only forgive them if they forgive one another with readiness and brotherly affection. Thus, they bring all their guilt before God and pray as a body for forgiveness. God forgive, not nearly me, my debts, but us, our debts. It's a very powerful part of that he's making here. Because not only in the Lord's Prayer are we talking about forgiveness, 
But just three verses further, or two actually, Jesus reiterates again. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's found in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. It's very powerful. Forgiveness is a two-way street. For God to forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, we have to be willing collectively to forgive each other the same thing. An unforgiving spirit is not a spirit that can deal or be with Christ. We have to be willing to forgive. Now, this is how many times these words appear if, when I did a, a search on Bible Gateway for the New King James. To forgive, 102 times. Forgiven, 52. And forgiveness, 14. But the topic of the sermon today is actually this mercy, grace. And as we can see, mercy by far has mentions in the Bible 276 times, and grace has 146. These three things are three components that I believe go together. God cannot show us forgiveness for sins if he is not a merciful and graceful God. We cannot show relief of sins or forgiveness to others if we are also not merciful and full of grace. To be like Christ, to forgive like Christ, and to forgive like God is to have mercy and grace and compassion on our fellow human beings. That's why things that were happening this spring and this summer and this fall in our societies and even this past month or so with the election results has driven this country apart. We cannot forgive the events that have happened, but we must if we are to continue. And the Bible is full of all different kinds of stories about forgiveness. And it starts right in the very beginning. We don't get three chapters into the Bible before we have God coming to forgive Adam and Eve. And here it says, the serpent spoke to the woman, you will not surely die when she eats the fruit. And that's verse 4. Also verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, why did he have to clothe them with skins of tunic or tunics of skin? And that's because in verse 7 it is told, then their eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves skins. They felt and realized the shame, the guilt that had happened to them when they broke God's one commandment that he had for them, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. With that sin came shame and guilt and a need to be covered by Christ for the forgiveness. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Something had to die that day for their sins, and that was the lamb that the tunics were made from. Even in the very beginning, God could have wiped out Adam and Eve. He could have wiped out the serpent right then and there in the garden as he's talking to all three people there. But he shows mercy, grace, forgiveness, and love to his created beings. That is the example that we are to live by, to show mercy and grace and compassion. And this story in the Bible, I just love it. It's the story of the paralytic man that there was no room for them to bring him in before Jesus to heal him. So his friends lower him through the roof. And I don't have time to read the whole story, but we all know it. This is what he says to the man. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. And this is what drove the Pharisees and scribes crazy because they thought only God had the power to forgive sins, which he does. But Jesus being God's representative on earth also had that power. And he goes on to say this in verses 22 and 24 in Luke chapter five. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. This act of forgiveness that Jesus is giving and talking about to the man when he says your sins are forgiven, we personally cannot see the interaction of 
his sins being forgiven by Jesus. There is no dove descending on him to show him that his sins were forgiven. The only way we can see that his sins were forgiven is when Jesus tells him to get up and walk. There is an action by Jesus to forgive, and the reaction is he can walk again. He was in personal bondage from sin. He was paralyzed by the grip of it, and now he is free to walk. And just so you know that this isn't just a Bible story about forgiveness, this act of healing that comes with it, in my time in Rush City at the prison there, doing the sermons and visiting and doing Bible studies, I have seen this principle in action. I have seen forgiveness turn a person's life around. We had a, ma a man that was there that was coming to our church services. Now he had done some bad things to some of the children in his family. He was really struggling with the fact that he wanted to be able to connect with, reconnect with his children, but his spouse wasn't letting him. She couldn't get past what he had done. And I don't blame her for not getting past it. I mean, I'm not here to say whatever he did was right or wrong. It definitely was wrong because he landed in prison. But this really put him in a tailspin when he could not connect with his family. He stopped coming to our services. We would pass him as we were leaving and he wouldn't even look at us anymore. He would just hang his head down and look at the floor as he was going to the himself to get ready for lunch, to help serve the lunch. After about six months of him not coming to our services, the next time I was there, so was he. But now his personality had changed. He was happy. He was upbeat. He was looking us in the eyes. His wife had given him permission to speak to his daughters. And that's all he was asking for. And when he got that permission or that forgiveness to at least start, it turned his life around. He became so enthralled in our worship services that we let him choose the music to be played because he was part of the prison, the prison band there. And let me tell you, these guys are really good. I know Steve and Jeannie Hebert can attest to that fact, and so can some of the other members that have been in the prison with us. Jeff can attest to that, Jeff Coran. These guys are really good. And I, and I turned the music service part of this service to them. And without even knowing what I was talking about, these guys had the perfect songs every week for me. His life got turned around by his wife being able to forgive just a little so he could talk to his children. That's the power of forgiveness. That's the power of the forgiveness we see in these stories of Jesus. The first two stories that I talked about were unconditional. My story was conditional on the fact that his wife had to um, forgive him and be allow, allow him to speak to his children. Unconditional forgiveness. There was no restrictions to God and Jesus when they forgave Adam and Eve. Dad can say, I will forgive you and you have to worship me or do this. He just forgave. The paralytic man wasn't given a condition on his forgiveness. I'll forgive your sins if you do this. But that's not the only stories we have in the Bible about the forgiveness of sins. Conditional forgiveness is if when Jesus says to someone, your sins are forgiven and go and sin no more. That's the type of forgiveness we sometimes put on other people. I can only forgive you if you promise not to do this, this, or this. Or I can only promise if you're not going to do if you're not going to drink again, if you're not going to hit me again, if you're not going to do drugs again, if you're not going to, if you're not going to stop watching pornography, if you're not going to do any one of these things, I cannot forgive you anymore. I can't have you around. That's when we put conditions on each and every one of us. Sometimes those constrictions, constrictions or conditions are more of a restraint to us for not forgiving the other person their deeds. It doesn't mean you condone what they do. It doesn't mean that you agree with what has been happening to you and you don't even have to forget it. It just means to let go of the anger and the hurt that's inside of you, the resentment. This is the type of forgiveness that Jesus is talking about in Matthew when he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. It's very powerful. God wants us to be forgiving. It's part of his character. 
And if we are in the made in the image of God, that's part of our character too. This, sir, this is a couple of pictures from the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. And just before the story happens, Peter asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive my fellow brethren? Seven? You know, the Jews had figured out that three was good enough, three times, but Peter goes the extra mile. He's thinking, say, hey, what if I forgive him seven? And Jesus goes, no, what about 70 times seven? It's the same, same amount of time or how many times we see in Daniel. How long until in his 2300-day prophecy where he says 70 weeks are determined for you? 70 times 7, 490. In Jewish way of thinking, 490 or seven sets of seven, the next set is a jubilee. The next set for the, the, of sevens is going to be a jubilee year. Or in this case, a jubilee on steroids, seven years of it. In the jubilee, sins were forgiven. Debts were forgiven. Slaves were freed. Property went back to the original owners. Everything was forgiven. In this story, we see a servant begging for mercy in front of a king who he owes 10,000 talents. Now, if it's 10,000 talents of gold, that's roughly $200 billion today's money, a debt we could never repay. Any one of us. And he pleads for his life because the king was going to throw him in the debtor's prison and his family and sell his wife and his kids and his into slavery and try and recoup some of the losses that he had. But the king graciously forgives the debt, the debt that none of us could repay. So as the man has forgiven his sins or his debt, he goes out and finds a person that owes him maybe $40 in today's money. Roughly for a lot of us, less than a day's work of wages. I'm sure if you were to ask me if I owed you $40, by the end of the day, I could come up with $40 to give you. But he's not willing to give his fellow servant, his fellow man, the chance to do this. He immediately throws him in prison. Has him take the punishment that was due for him, for his massive debt. But when the other servants heard about this and they go back to the king, and they tell the king that the servant you forgave 10,000 talents of gold won't even forgive a day's wage. The king had him thrown in jail. Forgiving spirit cost him his forgiveness. We all know who these people represent. The king is God, of course. And we are the servant with the huge debt of sin that cost Christ his life. The other servant is our neighbor's. It's the people we see every day at work, at school, at the grocery store, at Walmart, Target, wherever, walking down the street if it's nice enough to do it. Those are our neighbors. When the rich young ruler asked God what the greatest commandment was, and Jesus goes to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. To love someone is to be able to forgive someone, and to forgive someone to be able to love them. It kind of goes hand in hand. It all goes back to that character of God. If we are made in his image, we are in the image of love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Other examples of great stories of forgiveness in the Bible, of course, Jacob and Esau. Who can forget about David and his brothers, the prodigal son? And what about the stoning of Stephen? Stephen says the very same thing that Jesus says, forgive them their sins. Are you willing to forgive someone who's persecuting you? Who's killing you at the time? Can you forgive them their actions and their deeds? With Stephen's prayer and acts, we, he, we know he definitely could. And also, here's another one of my favorite stories. The story of the woman brought to Jesus in adultery. Shows can, shows forgiveness and we all know the story that she's brought there and the pharisees are accusing her of adultery and they're trying to trap trap jesus in the mosaic law by asking well should we stone her that's what moses law says we should do and we know that jesus bends down and writes on the ground and we we'll always come to the conclusion that he's writing down their sins but when he says when jesus raised him and he goes those of you who are without sin cast the first stone and they slowly go away. 
When we come to the end of the story, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And that's from John chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. And when I was reading those and getting ready for this sermon, woke up this morning and these verses just hit me after I had prepared this. To go along with John 8, 10 to 11, we also must read John 3, 16 and 17. And of course, we know what John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes him in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in verse 17, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The only way this world could be saved from the condemnation that we deserve is through the forgiveness of God, through the forgiveness and belief in Jesus Christ and that forgiving power. Which also brings me to Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul is telling us here after his great work of Romans 1 through 7, that there is now none of us who are condemned under the law of sin because Jesus has saved us from it. And we now walk according to the spirit and not according to the law. To walk according to the spirit is to have the Jesus-like principles of forgiveness, mercy, and grace. We can't get, I can't get beyond those three working together. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And that's Proverbs 28, verse 13. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah 55, verse 7. In him, we have redemption through the blood or through blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. That's Ephesians 1, verse 7. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all, to all who call on you. Psalm 86, verse 5. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 4, 32. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3, verse 13. And then this, the picture of the cross, where we see all three of these components coming together. We see mercy, we see grace, and we see forgiveness. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And in yesterday's devotional, Pastor, you hit this right on the head, and I couldn't better myself. This cross is for the sins of those who are in Jesus's face, mocking him, beriddling him. If you can save others, save yourself. Come on down if you are the king of the Jews. Maybe Elijah can help you. All that ridicule that he faced for taking upon us or upon him, all of our sins and grievances to bear solely on his shoulders. Not just the sin and people that were there, or the Roman soldiers or the Pharisees or the high priests or the mockers, but your sins and mine. All of our sins were put on him that day. And to forgive them, for they know what, what they do, he's forgiving us as well. He already knew that we were going to be sinful. He already knew that we would be this way. Forgiveness does not erase the past, but looks upon it with compassion. To withhold forgiveness keeps alive emotions of hurt, anger, and blame, which discolor our perception of life. Forgiveness liberates the soul. It removes fear. That is why it is power, a powerful weapon. I don't know if I've ever really thought of forgiveness as being a weapon. I've always known forgiveness to be freeing. I've always known forgiveness to bring peace. I've always known forgiveness to make me feel better, and hopefully the other person as well. But a weapon? 
Forgiveness is a very powerful thing. Like the story I said about the guy who was at our prison. We were concerned we actually told the guards about him, that he may do something to harm himself. So they kept a closer watch on him. But that power of what forgiveness, man, did it set him free. And that's what's waiting for each and every one of us when we forgive. It's the power to be set free. I think I finally know what Paul was talking about in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 with the power of forgiveness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. There's a peace that, a different kind of peace that comes from forgiveness. It's the peace that surpasses all understanding. As seeing the sinfulness of sin, while helpless before the cross, asking forgiveness and strength, our prayer is heard and answered. Those who present their petitions to God in Christ's name will never be turned away. The Lord says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will regard the prayer of destitute. <laughs> our help comes from him who holds all things in his hands. The peace that he sends is the assurance of his love to us. And that's from Ellen White's book, Prayer, page 239, paragraph 2. It fits in with Paul's writing in Philippians 4. He, the peace that he sends, the assurance of his love, his forgiveness, and his mercy. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. That's John, from John 14, verse 27. The peace that Jesus gives to us, the peace that surpasses all understanding, is the peace that comes with forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5, chap, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation means to make right. Forgiveness makes us whole. We are to take this word of reconciliation, as Paul says, that is our ministry to share with everyone how we can be all reconciled to God through prayer, through forgiveness, through his love and through his mercy. In his song, Forgiveness by Matthew West, it's the hardest thing to do today. It's the last thing you want to do today, but it sets the prisoner free. And the prisoner is us. We are unable to forgive. We are still in prison to chains of resentment, anger, envy, hatefulness, pride, we need those chains broken so we can forgive and have peace. 